Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all. Thank you for being here today. Those of you who are here in the room, those who are uh, watching on Facebook and those who will watch later on YouTube as well. Thank you for that. Um, a couple of announcements before we uh, turn it over to the choir. Uh, do remember that uh, this Wednesday night we're going to start back our, uh, our Wednesday evening service. And so a uh, prayer meeting will be in, uh, in this room and then uh, youth are going to be meeting. I don't know where they're meeting. Uh, we just, we're going to make Adam leave and just go somewhere. We're not sure. And uh, no, that he'll, uh, he'll let the kids know. And then uh, uh, Joe Don will have the kids in Awana. Uh, Donna's ladies Bible study will start back. Those of you who are involved in that, that's going to kick back off on Wednesday night. And then choir uh, will be after, when we wrap all that stuff up, uh, choir will be afterwards. I think they'll probably try to start about 6.50 or so. So 6 o'clock Wednesday night, all those things. Uh, kick off. Also, let me let me make an appeal to you. Uh, we are needing some nursery workers. Uh, one of the things we're going to make sure we're providing uh, during uh, Wednesday nights and also on Sundays uh, starting next week, because Children's Church is going to start next week, is we're going to provide uh, nursery. Now, we kind of polled some of our people, and there's not a huge need right now, uh, but we do need workers. And so let me encourage you. I'm going to soapbox for a minute. Okay, and it's going to be recorded, and it's going to be there forever. No one who has children should ever have to keep their own kids in the nursery. And here's why. The nursery is a ministry. It's a ministry to young families so they can come to church and worship and know that their kids are taken care of. So here's what I want to encourage you on. If you are a person who is an empty nester, and that's as much age as I'll get to, okay? <laughs> if you are an empty nester, I want you to pray about working in the nursery. Because if we as a church are going to reach young families, then those young families need to know when they come, their kids are taken care of, and they can go and they can worship and find their place to serve in the church. And later on in life, when they're empty nesters, they'll work <laughs> in the nursery. But I'm a big believer that no one should ever have to keep their own kids uh, in the nursery. I've seen my wife have to do that uh, at a church where my kids were the only kids. There were entire months. I mean, we had a month of January one time where Donna would walk across the parking lot, keep our kids in the nursery, and then go home and never make it to the sanctuary. Just because there wasn't anybody to keep nursery. It's, it, that is not the goal. We are to serve one another. So empty nesters, pray about it. Think about it. If you're interested, let Joe Don know because there's some things. If you're not currently working in the nursery, uh, there's background checks and things like that we have to run. We will be asking uh, nursery workers, obviously, to wear masks because that's a very close-up uh, situation in dealing with the kids. So just pray about that. Um, don't pray too much. The Lord just wants you to do it. Just tell me. No, pray about it. I know everybody has their own special place of service, but that is the perfect ministry uh, for you and I to be able to serve uh, younger families. So nursery workers. One more thing, and I realized that having a conversation with, uh, with somebody a minute ago, my email has not, I hadn't been able to update my email uh, since probably, I didn't realize it, probably Thursday afternoon. If you sent me an email in the last few days, I didn't get it. Um, and often our email has been very, in fact, let me just say this, if since I've been here, and I've been here a little over a year now, and you have sent me an email and I haven't responded, it's because I didn't get it. Our email often can be very unreliable. All that's changing. Uh, our new website will be coming online very soon. Our email is going to be much more reliable. If you never got a response from me uh, for an email, I didn't get it because that, that is a huge pet peeve for me. If you, if, even if it's just, hey, I got it, give me some time to think about it. So if you, and this is for everybody watching too, I didn't plan on saying all this, but if, if, cause every now and then somebody will say, Hey, I sent you this and I didn't hear, hear back. That means I didn't get it. Um, so if you sent one this week in the last few days, I haven't gotten it. So if there's something you need to tell me, uh, come up and let me know. Hopefully we'll get that, uh, taken care of this week. Well, guys, that's all the, uh, the announcements and stuff that I have. I know all of you are, is just killing you to talk to Joe Don about volunteering for the nursery. Uh, but wait until after service because we're just getting started. So uh, let me pray for us and then uh, the choir is going to sing. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together, to serve together. Lord, I pray for the choir as they sing here in a moment that they would just bring glory and honor to your name. 
Lord, I pray as, as Adam comes up, as Joe Don comes up, as we hear scripture read, as we pray together, as Bill leads us in music, as I preach the word, I pray for every one of us in this room, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit and that everything we do in here today would bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus alone. We pray this in his name. Amen. church family. Good morning, guests. Uh, this morning, I'm going to be sharing with you out of Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5, and the header over this psalm is, tell of all his wonderful works. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonder, wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. 
Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments that he uttered. Let me just encourage us this morning from this passage that we would sing with everything that we have, that we would worship, not just in this room on Sunday morning, but that every act of obedience, every opportunity through this week to choose God's way instead of our own would be an act of worship, that we would offer ourselves as living sacrifices of worship throughout this week. Thank you, Adam. Well, this uh, hymn that we're going to sing today, uh, as I learned it as a child, we used to hold several of these uh, notes throughout that you'll understand once we start singing. Several times through the song, you hold the note for several beats, and y'all remember that? He leadeth me. Uh, well, we're going to sing straight through it today. There, we will hold a little bit on the chorus. I just thought I'd instruct you in that way so that, you know, you don't get discouraged. We're just going to kind of go through it quicker today because uh, so, we don't have the music in front of us. But would you stand and sing, please? good to see you this morning. Uh, what a thought. Where would we be without God leading us? How lost we would be. So let's think about that as we go to the Lord in prayer together, okay? Let's pray together. Father God, I praise you this morning that you are the Father of mercies. Father, you invite us in your word and we can come with confidence uh, before your throne of grace to receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Uh, Lord, you have mercy for every need. Uh, there's nothing that we go through that you can't help us with and help us through. And we praise you for that this morning. Father, I, 
just want to take a moment just to say that we're here to worship you. And we're here to acknowledge humbly that we need you in everything. And so we look to you for that today. Father, I, we have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for leading us. Uh, we thank you for how you provide for us. We thank you for our church. Um, Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. And so humbly, Lord, we come to worship you and we pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would move in our hearts, that you'd open our eyes to understand your word today. Pray for Brother John. Lord, empower him by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that we would be ready to respond in the way that you call us to. Father, I pray that we would respond in faith and obedience, and we'll give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our second hymn today is Lamb of God by Twilight Paris. A great song. It's been around about 30, 40 years now, but um, it's, it's one of the great modern hymns. Let's sing it together. today as well. It was a powerful piece. Uh, thank you so much for that, guys. And, uh, you know, one of the darkest times in all of Scripture is the book of Judges. I don't know. I, I joke every now and then and tell people, if you're on a spiritual high and want to get spiritually depressed, read the book of Judges. I don't know why you would do that, but that's what would happen. Uh, as you go through Judges, it just becomes progressively more sinful uh, as, you, as you go through it. Even people that we hold up as heroes in the book of Judges uh, often uh, were really a whole lot worse than we think. Uh, I challenge you to go and read the entire story of Samson. Uh, it's not what you learned in Sunday school that when you get all the stories to come in. Or Gideon, 
as a matter of fact. We celebrate Gideon and his faith and the fleece and the, all that, and yet Gideon ultimately led the nation into idolatry. So it, it, it's, a, it's fascinating as you go through the book of Judges. And what would happen is, is as, after the generation that knew Joshua and the leadership under Joshua, once that generation died, the, the nation of Israel would fall into sin. And then as they fell into sin, God would send people from outside the nation to come in and to oppress them. Think, think like uh, the seven samurai or, or, or the magnificent seven or something like that. People would come in and raid and take and, and then go back out, but they were under constant oppression. And then they would, would cry out to the Lord and the Lord would raise up a judge, a military leader. And that person would defeat the enemy and then there would be peace. And then when that person died, then the nation would fall into sin again. And they'd be oppressed by a, and a people from the outside and they'd cry out to God and God would raise up a judge and that judge would deliver them. And then when that judge died, they'd fall into sin again. It was this pattern all throughout the book of Judges. But during that time, there were still people who were faithful. There were still people who loved the Lord. There were still people who didn't fall into the patterns of rebellion. And the book of Ruth is an example of that. And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ruth. We're going to look at the entire book today because it's really just one big story. Uh, we'll finish up about three o'clock if that's okay with you guys. Now, I will, we'll, we'll walk through it pretty quickly, actually. We'll just, just, we'll just read the story together. I'll bring in some stuff and then we'll see what we see at the end. But the book of Ruth is an example during the time of the judges of godly people. And God using godly people to accomplish his eternal will. So I'm just going to start out reading uh, the book of Ruth. It's just four chapters. Don't worry. Let me read the first few verses. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed, that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they enter the land of Moab and remain there. So we get an introduction. We're told by the writer, and we're not 100% sure who the writer is. Uh, uh, some, some people say it's Samuel. Some people say it's maybe some other recorder uh, during the time of David or Solomon. We're just, it, they don't identify themselves. But the writer here lets us know, there in verse 1, it's the time of, the, of Judges. It's the time set. This is within the book of Judges itself is, is that time period. And a famine breaks out. We're not told why. Often God uses famine to bring judgment, so maybe, the, this, maybe there was a lot of sinfulness in that area around Bethlehem, and so famine had, had come. And he mentions a town in Judah, Bethlehem. Now that should immediately make our ears, our spiritual ears, and our New Testament ears perk up. We sing a song about it every year, Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. This is, this is one of the key cities, one of the key towns in the history of salvation. So we're going to learn a little bit about it. And it says that they left, and they left the, the nation, and they went to sojourn in the land of Moab. So they head east on the other side of the Dead Sea to the land of the Moabites. Now, the Moabites were, were cousins, really, of the nation of Israel. They came out of a relation, an incestuous relationship between Lot, Abraham's nephew, and Lot's daughter. So there was a connection there. There, there was uh, so, some shared heritage. They were cousins. And so they go to a land of people not unfamiliar, with similar language, similar culture. And the writer here mentions his family. There's this man, Elimelech, whose name means my God is king. And then his wife is Naomi. And it's important to know that her name means pleasant because she's going to talk about that later. And then he mentions two sons, Malon and Chilion. You know what their names mean? Sick and tired. <laughs> no, actually, it means sick and frail. Sick and tired makes it funnier. No, it's sick and frail. Sick and frail. That's what their name. Can you imagine? Like, this is a Limelech, you know, a powerful name. This is my wife, Naomi. Oh, that's a pretty name. These are my two sons, sick and frail. But that's what their names mean. Well, there's a reason for that. Oh, sick and tired, sick and frail. Verse 11, verse, uh, verse number three. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. 
Then they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years in both Malon and Chilion, so sick and frail, died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. So when she left, she had her husband and she had her two boys. And now after 10 years, her husband is gone and both of her boys are gone. And she's left with her two daughters-in-law. And that's where they find themselves. Verse 6, and she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. They began to head back west. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted their voices and wept. Here's what she did. She turned around to her daughters-in-law, to Ruth and Orpah and said, look, go back to your family and start over. You need to go back to your family and and start your life. You need to find another husband. You need to go back and, and, and just forget this time. I appreciate you've loved me. You've loved my family. You love my boys, my husband and me. But you guys, for your own sake, for your own protection, for your own provision, go back home and let your family take care of you. It's very loving, very compassionate. She's concerned about these women. She loves them. They're they're part of her family and they love her. Notice verse 10. And they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go for I'm too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it's harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. She's there like, we're going to stay with you. Apparently, they loved her so much and, and were so concerned and, and they were so much of a family. The, these two daughters-in-law are like, we're going to stay with you. And she says, this doesn't make sense. I, I can't have any more, more sons for you. And even if I could, would you wait until they were grown? No, go back to your family so that you can be provided for. Verse 14, and they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. A little indication that something's going on. Verse 15. Then she says, she's talking to Ruth, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or, or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God, whatever this family, whatever, and we're not told specifically, was it right or wrong for them to to leave the promised land and go into Moab? We're, We're not told all those things, but here's what we know. The witness of this family had affected Ruth to the point where she was like, I'm gonna abandon the gods of my family. I'm gonna abandon my people. I'm gonna abandon that paganism and, and I'm gonna, gonna come with you. I'm gonna cling to you. I'm gonna follow your God. I'm gonna be part of your people. She has seen something in her father-in-law who's now dead, in, in her husband who is now dead, in her mother-in-law who she's with and says, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna follow your God because she's seen it lived out. Verse 17, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you and me. For she saw that she was determined to go with her and she said no more to her. She was finally like, uh, Naomi was finally like, okay, come on, come with me. So they go back to Bethlehem, verse 19. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? I mean, think about it. When she left, she was with her husband and she was with, with her boys. And now she's coming back and it's just her. It's been 10 years have passed. She's been through a lot and it's just her and this one other lady who they don't know that they're going to find out is Ruth, her daughter-in-law. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara. Mara means bitter. In other words, she says, call me the opposite of what you would think of me. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned with her, with, with, and with her Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. 
And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. They get there uh, right around March, April, that time in spring. So that's the setting. That, that's the setup. She left with her husband and her two boys, and now 10 years later, she's back, and it's just her and her daughter-in-law. And because of the way society was set up, they're going to be destitute. If it was today, they'd be out on the street. They wouldn't have anywhere to live. They wouldn't have anybody to support them. Everything had been cut out from under them. So what are they going to do? Well, let's see. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, who, Elimelech whose name was Boaz. And Ruth Moabitess said to Naomi, Please, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain uh, after one in whose sight I may found favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So what's going on here? One of the things that the nation of Israel did to provide for the poor, one of the things that God actually put in place to provide for the poor was this idea that they could go into the fields and as people were harvesting, the poor could follow along and pick up anything that had fallen to the side. In fact, let me read it to you. Uh, Leviticus chapter 19 verses 9 and 10 says, Now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. Nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. It was a way for the poor to be provided for. And that's exactly who Ruth and Naomi are. They, they've lost all of their, their standing in the community because, because her husband has passed away and because the boys are gone too. Verse 3 of chapter 2. So she departed and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And then here's great. And she happened... To come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, the writer is really kind of being ironic here because we know in God's plan there is no coincidence. There is no surprise. God sent her specifically to where she needed to be in Ruth 2 to get us to Ruth chapter 4. Verse 4, Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his, servants, who, his servant who is in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? He sees somebody there he doesn't recognize, somebody new. The servant in charge of the reapers replied, She's the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now, and she's been sitting in the house for a little while. So Boaz shows up. He sees somebody he hasn't seen before, and he asks about her. We see that he's a godly man. He, he's talking to his servants, and they show respect to him, and he shows respect to them, and they praise the Lord while they're doing it. He's one of the good ones in the time of sin, in a time of rebellion against God, in the time of the judges. We have Boaz. Verse 8, then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. And when you're thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? You want me to let you, let you in on a little something? You know why he's having mercy on a foreigner? And we know this. We learned this from Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. Boaz's mother was Rahab. Rahab. His mother was not from the nation of Israel. His mom was Rahab the harlot. He knew what it meant to come in as an outsider. He knew what that looked like. And he's showing grace and he's showing mercy to this woman that he's heard about who has been so loyal to her mother-in-law. Verse 11, Boaz replied to her, All that you've done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel. And then here it is. You need to underline this because it comes up later. Under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. He recognizes some theology going on here. That she has abandoned her people. She has abandoned her pagan gods. And she is seeking refuge under the true God. Under God Almighty, the creator of the universe. He says, that's why I'm showing you favor. Because you're a godly woman. 
Verse 13, then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. A little bit of time passes and it's mealtime. Verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here, that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. Now remember, she's basically homeless and on the street. She's just there to be able to provide and to be able to survive and he's taking care of her. Verse 15, when she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servants saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So he pulls his guys aside and he says, look, you see her? You make sure that she gets plenty. And by making sure, you, you, you double make sure she gets plenty. Because these people are part of his family. We're going to find that out. We're going to know when, in a conversation. He is in a position to do something for them. But right now in the moment, he sees her godliness. He sees, he's heard about who she is. And he pulls his guys aside and he says, nobody's to bother her. And y'all make sure that she has a successful day out here. He's a godly guy. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. Some people say that could be anywhere from 30 to, to 50 pounds. It was a good day. Verse 18, she took it and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, well, where'd you glean today and where'd you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with, with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. And you know the moment she said that, Naomi understood God was up to something. She could have gone to a lot of places and she ends up in this one field, ends up, air quotes, in this one field for God to do something amazing here. Verse 20, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. That word closest relatives is the idea of a kinsman redeemer. He's there. He can redeem them. He can, he can do something, and we'll talk, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it more as we continue on. But Boaz has the opportunity to rescue them, to redeem them, to get them out of their situation. Verse 21, then Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, you, shall, you should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It's good, my daughter that you go out with the maid so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So the second scene really kind of closes. If you think of it as a TV show, really the second episode ends. Now she finds herself in a place of safety amongst godly people, having been provided for. And Naomi knows that there's potential here for something else. Let's see what happens. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Remember, she wanted them to go back to their families and be taken care of. She is concerned for her daughter-in-law. She loves her and, and, and wants her to be protected and be provided for. And, and Ruth had decided to go with her. And so now she's taking it upon herself as a mother-in-law, as a mother to say, okay, I'm gonna take care of you. Verse two, she says, now is not Boaz our kinsman whose maid, who, whose maid you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. So some time has passed, a couple of months have passed. We're now in the, probably into May. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go to the, th the threshing floor. Do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall take notice of the place where he lies and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down and then he will tell you what you shall do. Now, these have to be strange instructions to her, but she's going to do it. She said to her, all that you say, I will do. So some time has passed, a few weeks have passed. She pulls Ruth aside and says, here's what we're going to do. This man is in a position. He can, he can do something. He can redeem us. 
He can rescue us. And so I want you to go after he's had supper. They've got a hard day at work. This is a special time of year. After he's eaten and had plenty to drink, you know how you fall asleep on the couch after supper. He said, and, you know, after he does that, when he lays down for the night, you go, you lay there, you uncover his feet. That'll probably wake him up during the night. You know, his feet are going to get a little cold. And so he's going to wake up and then he'll understand what's going on. He'll tell you what to do. And that's fairly vague. But Ruth says, okay, yeah, I'll do it. She loves her mother-in-law. She knows, she knows this is a godly family, so she's willing. Verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz, Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, right? He's happy. It's like after Thanksgiving, you know, the turkey puts you to sleep. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And it happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. Now, have any of you ever woken up in the middle of the night with your kids staring you in the face? Right, they're right when they're that same height as the mattress, and they've come out of their, their bed in the middle of the night because something, something's going on, and they go, and you're like, whoa, you know, and there they are. That's what's happening here. All right, he went to sleep and had, had his stomach was full and he was happy and it had been a good day at work and you know this is an important time for, for, for business as they're they're harvesting and he wakes up in the middle of the night and there's a woman there. And she wasn't there when he went to sleep. And he's like, What in the world is going on? He can't see who it is in the dark because he has to ask. Verse nine. He said, Who are you? Seems like a natural question. Right? Who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your maid. And then here it is. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. You see that word for covering? It's the same word for wings that was used in chapter 2 and verse 12. When Boaz said, talked about how she had come under the wings of the God of Israel, now she's saying, put me under your wings. This is a theological conversation. She's saying, I'm trusting the Lord, and I'm trusting that you are going to do what the Lord has set you up to do. We are trusting that God is in this. She said, I am, he, she says, spread your covering, spread your wings over your maid, for you are a close relative. You are our kinsman redeemer. Verse 10, then he said, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to, to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. There was a bit of an age difference here. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city. Know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, it's true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Now, something occurred to me as I was going through this. She shows up in the middle of the night, and he sees her, and she explains what's going on. He recognizes that she is asking for him as the kinsman redeemer to take her in and, and to marry her and to provide for the family. And he immediately says... Yeah, I can do it, but there's somebody else a little bit closer. You know what that means? He's already thought about it. He had the, he, he'd already thought about it because he immediately had a response. He'd already, he already knew there was somebody else. He'd already done a little investigating. He was already aware of the situation that, yes, he was a kinsman redeemer. Yes, he could step up and take her into his family and provide an heir for, for her husband who had passed away so that the land returns, all those things that are involved. But he knew he was not the closest relative. He'd already talked about it to somebody. He'd already done the math. He was ready. So apparently, he was interested. Verse 14. She lay at his feet until morning and rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, he said, give me the cloak that is on you and hold it. And so she held it and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, well, how'd it go, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her. She said, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, do not go to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then she said, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. And I love this, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. See, he sends her food home, so she doesn't have to glean that day. She doesn't have to be out in the field. She's taken care of for the day. And so Naomi knows he's going to take care of this today. He, he's on board. He understands, and she's like, okay. 
Let's just wait. Let's see what God does. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat there. And behold, here's another of those holy coincidences. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. He just so happened to be passing by that morning. And so he said, turn aside, friend. Sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now the gate is where everybody, they would all gather there to do official business. And so this is really kind of like they're at the county courthouse to, to do something. Verse 2, he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. So now the officials are there. And he said to the close relatives, so he said to the other kinsman redeemer, Naomi's come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. Now, let me pause here and, and show you in Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 25. This is where this is coming from. Leviticus 25, 25 says, If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor he has to sell his property, then his nearest kinsman, his kinsman redeemer, is to come and buy back what, uh, what his relative has sold. That way the land stays in the family. It stays in the tribe. It stays in the clan. Because remember, the land had been allotted in the book of Joshua. God had decided who had what. And so they want to keep it in the land. So he's taught, that's what he's talking about now. Verse 4. So I thought to inform you, saying, buy it, before the, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I'm after you. And he said, well, I'll redeem it. So the, near, the, the nearer kinsman redeemer that Boaz is talking to when he first hears about it says, yeah, absolutely. I'll take it. I'll redeem it. You wonder, did his heart sink or did he know what he was about to say? I think he knew what he was about to say. I think. <laughs> no coincidences. Verse 5. Then Boaz said, okay. On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess. Uh, the widow of the deceased in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, well, I, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. So, so Boaz keeps his one negotiating tactic off the table for a minute. And then when this guy hears about it, he's like, oh, no, wait, that's going to mess up my legal stuff if I do that. So no, 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 you go ahead, you take it, you redeem it. Verse 7, we get a little bit of insight. It says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. Now this is odd, guys, but this is how they did it. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the manner of attestation in Israel. You, you, you didn't need somebody with a stamp. You know, you didn't need a notary public or anything like that. The elders of the city were there. The elders of the town were there. You took your sandal off and you handed it to the other guy and, and everybody was a witness to it. And if, if you agreed to it, it was legal. It was binding. So this is their contract, in other words. This is something that the elders are witnessing and they'll remember and know. Verse 8, so the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. And he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that have, I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belong to Elimelech and all that belong to Chilion and Malon. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Very legal language here. He's making sure everybody understands what's happening. Verse 11, they break out into, into praise and agreement. And all the people who were in the court, the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. All the, the boys that were the, the, the starts of the tribes, those, those, that was their moms. Well, not all of them. There were some concubines involved in that, but they were the official wives. So, and it says, And may you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. They basically had church in court. They were really excited. 
what was about to happen. They're recognizing that God is doing something here. They're praising him for it. They're like, this is great. These people have been gone for 10 years. They came back destitute. They really had no way to support themselves. These two ladies are going to be out on the street. And you have stepped up and done something according to scripture. You have become the kinsman redeemer. Now the land is going to stay in the family. Now they're going to be provided for. You're doing the right godly thing. May God bless you. And may you have more kids than you can stand. Basically is what they said. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. Notice it says the Lord enabled her to conceive. Never forget, God's in charge of everything, including the womb. Verse 14. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. Then may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. And then the writer tells us why he's telling us this. He is the father of Jesse father of David. See, this is how David's grandfather came into the world. That's who this is. That means that, that, that Boaz and Ruth are, are David's great-grandparents. That means that Rahab the harlot is his great-great-grandmother. God's doing something very unique here in the history of salvation. Notice how the writer wraps the chapter up, verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, and Ram of Benadab, and to Benadab was born Nashon, and, Nashon, and to Nashon Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse David. But I want you to see the complete genealogy. So turn, I want you to see Matthew chapter 1 and verse, or Matthew 1, 1 through 6, to see the more complete version of this. Matthew 1, 1 through 6. It'll be on the screen. should be. It says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez. That's where, the, where it picked up in Ruth, if you'll remember. And Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Abinadab. Abinadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. There she is. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. There she is. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. And we know that Solomon has a son, who has a son, who has a son, who ultimately ends in Christ. The point of the sermon is a simple one. God produces history to provide eternity. God produces history to provide eternity. That is exactly what God is doing in the book of Ruth. Because who is Jesus? He's our kinsman redeemer. He came and did something on our behalf, being fully God and fully man, and redeemed us from the curse of the law. Listen, listen to what Paul wrote in Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as Son. See, the reason Boaz could rescue Ruth and Naomi was because he was kin. He was near relation. He was their kinsman redeemer. And when Jesus came into the world, he did exactly something that, that we needed, and that is he became fully man, fully human, and became our kinsman redeemer so that he could go to a cross and die for you and for me and be our representatives. In fact, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17 says, Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become merciful and a faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, so that he could die for your sins and for mine. Jesus did what Boaz pictured. And that has become our kinsman redeemer, to come as fully human and fully God and experience everything that we have been tempted in and yet without sin and go to a cross and die for you and for me. Job saw it. Job 19.25 says, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. 
to Christ is. He is our redeemer. David himself would write. We just learned about how his grandfather came into the world. David himself would write in Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Jesus came to be our redeemer. And because he was fully God, and because he was fully man, he could go to a cross and be our substitute. He could be our kinsman redeemer. We see it pictured in the book of Ruth and this family that ultimately led and God used for Jesus himself to come into the world. God used this little family in Bethlehem to bring our eternal redemption. See, God takes history and uses it to accomplish his will. And that's a very comforting thought, especially in times like these. Think about this, a safe people. This is our family history. When you get together with your family and tell stories, usually they're you know, probably funny stories and here's how, here's how the grandparents met and remember what happened at this wedding and remember when this baby was born and all that stuff, those family stories that we tell. The book of Ruth is a part of that. If you're part of the family of God, this is our family story. And it's God working in history through, through real people and real actions and real choices with real consequences. And God bringing them together to bring about eternity, to bring about salvation, to, to, to bring about his people, to bring about his family. This is our story. This is our family Bible. If you grew up and, and there was a family Bible in, in, your, in your family, the Bible itself is our family Bible if we've repented of our sins and placed our faith in Christ. And this is one of those intimate little stories where God takes people who aren't even talked about in the book of Judges. They're not on anybody's radar. And God does something in them that's eternally important. And here's what that means. That means that God is still using history. He's still in charge of history, that there still are no coincidences, that there's still no chance, that he, everything that happens, he has his hands on and he allows. And as chaotic as the world may seem, God still operates and still functions exactly the same way we see in the book of Ruth. He does not change. And he is in absolute control of all time. Even when you turn on the news and there are city burnings, cities are on fire, and, and you're wondering about diseases and viruses and we're all wearing masks and, you know, you have to, it's all that stuff, all that chaos that, that from our perspective looks absolutely chaotic. It's not chaotic to God because he's in charge of history and we see it in this family. We see it in Obed being born. It ultimately leads to our savior coming into the world. That is a comforting and confident thought in a time that can be very discouraging. If you've given your life to Christ, if you're here today and you're a believer, I just want you to be comforted by this story and know that God is still up to something. History is lineal. It's going, it's going linear. It's going in a line that ultimately ends with the return of Christ. It's not chaotic. It's not like God just took his hand off and things are going crazy. He is up to something. You and I can't see it. They didn't know in the book of Ruth that God was what God was up to. They just knew they were being obedient to his word. And God used it to bring about our eternity. To bring about the family of God. If you're not part of that family, you can become a part of that family today. Because ultimately, out of the book of Ruth, ultimately Jesus Christ came into the world and died for you. He died and was buried and rose again on the third day. And the Bible is very clear that if you will repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And then this family story will be your family story. So today, give your life to Jesus. But here's what I want you to know as a believer. God is in absolute control. And he has a plan. Even when it doesn't look like it. Even when, when the world seems to be absolutely upside down. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. And he is absolutely in charge of history. 
Maybe as those of you who are in the room, those who are watching, may want to talk some more about what it means to be a part of God's family, for this story to be your story. Send a Facebook message to the church, or I'm going to give you an alternate uh, email address for me since my email's acting up. Uh, it's pastor.john.enoch at gmail.com. So pastor.john.enoch at gmail.com if you want to talk to me about what it means or have some questions. Or, and just talk through what it means to give your life to Christ. Or come and talk to me after service today. Talk to Adam, Joe Don, Bill, pull a deacon aside, a Sunday school teacher aside. If you need to know what it means to follow Christ, to be a part of his family, we'll explain that to you. But here, for those of us who know him, over, over 3,000 years ago, was, yeah, more than 3,000 years ago, in the little town of Bethlehem, God did something that they didn't even know what he was up to. They just knew they were going to be obedient to him. And God used it to bring about the most important thing in all of eternity. And that is Christ. God's in charge. He's in charge of all, even when it doesn't seem like it. Well, guys, thank you for being here today. I hope you found this story as comforting and as reassuring as I did. Like I said, if you want to talk, come and, and talk to us afterwards or send a Facebook message or send an email. But know today that God is in absolute control in all things. Well, guys, let's stand and turn your chairs around. Let me pray for us, guys, and then, uh, then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you are in charge of all things at all times. Protect us as we head home. Bring us back here to worship you together on Wednesday and next Sunday. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.